All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Thinking It Through with Dr. Naidu, child psychiatrist. So today we are talking to Jason Pratt. He is a therapist, a CEO, and a fellow podcaster. So <laughs> Jason has been working as a licensed counselor for over 20 years, and he specializes in the treatment of what we call dual diagnosis. So that's kind of code for mental health plus substance use, which are both huge overarching arenas. He has extensive experience with addiction and trauma, that comorbidity, or what we mean, those two things happening together, and treatment from a solution-focused perspective, which is a particular type of therapy. He's the current CEO and founder of a new behavioral health, a comprehensive outpatient mental health clinic based in Ohio and New Hampshire. He is also the former CEO, COO, sorry, of Lighthouse Youth and Family Services in Cincinnati, and also the former clinical director of the Phoenix House of Texas and New England. So he's also had so much clinical experience and then administrative experience running clinics and big organizations. So that's really key, understanding things from a systems approach as well as a clinically based approach. So I'm so excited to talk to him about all of those arenas. And he's also a podcaster. So he is the host and creator of the podcast Through Help and Back. Through Help and Back is a podcast focused on mental health, addiction, treatment, recovery, and all things that is included in personal improvement and wellness. So their focus really is to bring attention to the solution through the struggle, which is part of how Jason and I met. So Jason saw some of my Instagram reels on Mental Health Awareness Month in May, and he invited me to be a guest on his podcast where I spoke a little bit about how to make the most of your visit with a psychiatrist and about suicide prevention. So please check out that episode on his podcast, Through Help and Back. And it's always such a joy and a rarity to talk to a therapist who is a man. Male therapists are a very, very rare breed. So I'm so thankful to have Jason on here to talk about his perspective. So I'm so excited to welcome and chat with Jason Pratt on Thinking It Through with Dr. Naidu, child psychiatrist, how to man up with Jason Pratt. Wow. Welcome. Right. Wow, that was a mouthful. Thank you, Dr. Naidu. <laughs> I guess I've been busy. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. Yes, you sound very busy. So anything to add, anything I missed that you want to bring up? No, I'm, uh, you know, the most important stuff, right? I'm a dad. I have two children. I'm married. I'm a big family guy. That's a very important thing to me. And um, they've been with me through that whole ride that you just described. And um, it's, it's sort of a family business vibe. And so, no, I'm nothing really to add. Uh, it's a lot, uh, but it's also kind of, uh, it's been great, right? One of the greatest things about our field is that um, it's just so rewarding, right? Like these, there's, I think about those experiences and I think about the clients that I've met and the lives that may or may not have been changed and the impact that you have, it's, it's great. I mean, sales is awesome. I was in sales when I was young. Um, but it just feels different when you're talking about impacting client lives versus, you know, selling X number of cars or something like that. That really does the trick for me. So I don't know. It's been fun. It's nice to hear you sum it up like that. It's been a fun ride. So tell us a bit about that journey, because it sounds like you could have gone in many avenues. You did sales for a while. You have kids. Yeah. And as a guy, I think it's a very rare thing to become a therapist. What kind of drove you to become a counselor? What were those factors um, yeah. Why counseling versus anything else that you could have done? Yep. So to take it back, um, and I think it's important that people know this, I was an atrocious student uh, growing up my entire life. I was, I was an awful student. I, uh, I was a good test taker, uh, so that helped a lot, but I was a very bad student. And so, um, you know, my primary interest was, was sports. That was it, to be really honest. I went to school to have friends and to play sports. And that was it. And that was my primary focus. And class was something I had to do. And uh, that continued into undergrad. You know, I, I, I played some baseball and uh, it did pretty well. You know, got a couple trophies, a couple of awards. And, and in my head, I was going to be playing first base for the Cincinnati Reds. And mm -hmm. that was it. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, then a couple drafts come and go. And next thing you know, you're you're a junior. And you don't have a major declared yet. And you have a team of caring adults who sit down with you and go, hey, man, you know, there's still a lot of baseball to be played, but you need to think about some other stuff. You know, you need to think about what life's going to look like if, if you don't play first base for the Reds. And so um, for me, you know, I was raised around a lot of men, but I was raised by a lot of women. 
uh, my grandmother and my mother and uh, my aunt in particular, uh, two grandmothers actually, to be fair, were very present and very influential in my life. They sort of ran the house, you know, they took care of the kids, sort of a traditional family setting. Um, and, you know, the men worked. I mean, most of my family is in the military, you know, uh, so they're, you know, the males were, were tough guys carrying guns and, and rucking and, and the women were holding down the, the home, you know. And so because I was privileged and fortunate enough to go to college, I kind of had a different avenue to kind of express that and to connect with that. And that nurturing and that caring and that problem solving and that culture of communication, uh, women tend to naturally communicate a little differently than men do, right? Yeah. So I had picked that up and they were sort of natural pieces of my personality and my interests and uh, so when it became time to decide, like, what do you want to do with your life? You know, those were the things that I look back on that I connected with. I didn't like the mechanical stuff. I didn't like math. I didn't like numbers so much. I liked connecting and communicating with people. And I know that came from the women in my family. I mean, it's, there's really no other source, you know? And uh, so that's, that's where I went. And so I started with a psychology degree and I tried to combine some tough guy stuff and, and my interest in nurturing. And I wanted to be a prison I want to work in the prisons. I want oh. to be a prison psychologist. Yeah. And, um, and I studied under Dr. Robert Stoner and I did some rounds um, at a couple of prisons in Ohio. And I was, that's the way I was going to go um, until we went through our first lockdown. And I was stuck in his office for about nine hours because there was an incident on the floor and they couldn't find a prisoner. And when that happens, you, nobody goes anywhere. You sit yep. right there until they get it all figured out. Um, and so it was just one of those things of like, well, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I want to, you know, work and exist in an ecosystem where that could kind of happen at any moment. Uh, yep. Freedom and flexibility and autonomy are very important to me. They kind of fit with what yep. I do. So, you know, you can kind of continue on. And, and, and so what are some other ways I can apply this, you know, psychology background? And I'd, I'd earned a psychology degree at that time. And, and that led me to therapy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, media played a big role in that. Um, I grew up watching Growing Pains and the Seaver family, and he had him a little office in his house. And, yep. uh, you know, Good Will Hunting was a huge influential movie, right? And so Robin Williams, and they're all yep. doing therapy. And um, and so that's where it led me. Uh, I took a, I went to TCU, so Texas Christian University, where I did all my graduate work. Mm -hmm. um, I did the first semester in sports psychology, again, keeping nice. the, yeah, yeah. You know, I was an athlete, like, let's help athletes, right? Right, right. And then they put me in kinesiology courses and I was measuring, you know, respiratory output and I was had a pipette <laughs> in my hand and I said, no, 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 not, not this kind of, <laughs> you drug me back into the numbers and the science again, right? right and right. so uh, I literally remember the day I left the athletic center and I walked up the hill to the College of Education and I met with uh, Becky Taylor and uh, Frank Thomas, who both became mentors to me. And they kind of opened up my eyes to all the things that an LPC could do or an LCDC could do and all the different avenues that a counselor mm. could find work and kind of find a place to make an impact. And that was sort of the moment where it all came together. I can, I can help people. I can do this communication stuff. I get my flexibility, my autonomy. I can bounce between different specialties. Um, and that put me on that track. And um, so off I went. That's, that's kind of how it went. So to say there was a plan or to say that there was, you know, at six years old, I wrote it in my dream journal and I made it true. <laughs> like That's just not accurate. Um, I kind of found my way to it, one decision and one experience at a time, um, but forever grateful that I did. It's been a very rewarding career and I've, I've loved not every minute, but I've loved most of the minutes. So it's been good. Awesome. And I didn't know that you had that history with baseball and Mm -hmm. I'm definitely not sports savvy, but my husband loves <laughs> all sports. So yeah. I would just say to the audience of all the sports, I think the one that you need the most patience for mm. is baseball. Yeah. And when you're in therapy and you're the therapist, you also need to be patient, right? We're waiting for this. We're cultivating this perfect moment yep. and then sorting out when to hit that home run, right? You just need to yep. position everything together so that home run is most, most effective. And, and resiliency. Don't forget the resiliency part. Baseball is a game of failure. Mm. If you fail seven out of 10 times in baseball, you go to the Hall of Fame because 300 hitters go to the Hall of Fame. Mm. So if you, if you walk back to the dugout with your head down, feeling bad seven out of 10 times, you're one of the best that's ever done the game. So, yep, you got to be mentally tough. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so tell us a little bit about counselors. You mentioned these these acronyms, uh, LPC yeah. and DPC. Tell me what those are. And and right now, I've noticed living in New York City, living in upstate New York, living in um, in Arizona, different mm -hmm. cultures within the U.S. use the words therapy, counseling, yeah. coaching, all differently. Yeah. The words have meaning. So tell me what a counselor does that's yeah. different than a social worker or a psychologist um, and how how they might be similar too. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I'll get on my soapbox for one second. I promise I won't derail. But we have to, as an industry, resolve this state by state change. And ABC means something in Missouri, but it doesn't mean something in Louisiana. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have got to work towards national accreditation, national licensure, national I certification. I agree, agree. Totally. Um, it, it is so silly. My first big boy job was in Richmond, Indiana. I lived in Ohio and I drove 10 minutes and all of a sudden my licensure meant something completely different, right? And so what happened between that drive <laughs> in Bellbrook, Ohio to nothing, nothing changed, but it was like a whole nother set of rules. Um, so just my little, my little two cents there, we have to look at national certification. If you're, if you're a social worker or you're a therapist, or you're a counselor in Florida, you are one in California, period, end of story. Let's get the, the barriers out of the way and let's make that happen. Right. Um, but so, you know, for me, LPC is a licensed professional counselor, right? And so, you know, there's different, different ways. There's a licensed social worker, LSW. There's a licensed independent social worker, which is LISW, a licensed professional counselor, LPC, licensed professional clinical counselor. Oh, by the way, there's an LCSW, which is the clinical social worker. And then you've got your LCDC, which is your chemical dependency counselors. Uh, level one, two, and three, uh, mm -hmm. and then you've got your independent there. So in function, and as far as uh, the listeners are concerned, the counselor versus the social worker in today's world functions largely the same. Absolutely. It, wasn't the, it wasn't the intent when it first started. A social worker was supposed to be more resource acquisition, build the treatment plan, rally these resources, and connect people to the larger picture. The counselor that was more of like a therapist, the person like, you know, the Freudian days, the guys on the couch taking notes, doing the therapy. Um, but it's adjusted over the years. And so for the, at least the last 15, 20 years where I've been involved, they function largely the same. And that's kind of the best way to connect to it. Um, I mentioned Goodwill Hunting. They're Robin Williams. They're doing the therapy. Uh, they're doing assessments uh, to differing degrees of expertise. Some people can diagnose. Some people have to work with their supervisor to arrive at a diagnosis. But they are the person who's going to help you determine you know, what the problem is, connect you to other resources that will support you in healing from that problem or dealing with that problem. And they're going to be able to do your day in and day out therapy, right? So if you deal with anxiety, they're going to be working on you know, relaxation techniques. They're going to be working on breathing techniques. They're going to help you understand the root of anxiety and the biological causes. And if that's part of the issue, they're going to connect you with a, a sleep expert or they're going to connect you with a doctor to help treat that. Um, they are going to be doing the nuts and bolts therapy. Um, the counselor and the social work terms are important because when you read these state statutes, there are things that people can call themselves and things that people can't call themselves. And so counselor, funny enough, because you think of like a camp counselor, it's actually one of those privileged labels. You have to earn the right to be a counselor, mm -hmm. call yourself a counselor. Social worker is the same way. You've got to complete amount, you know, X amount of years of education. You've got to test be under supervision, continuing education, like that's an earned thing. Mm -hmm. Coach and like uh, even therapist are a mm -hmm. little loose, um, which is interesting because therapist felt heavier to me when I got into it, uh -huh. right? As a yeah. therapist, that's really serious. Um, but actually most people can call themselves a therapist. Um, there's not a lot of licensing in most states around the use of the word therapist. Mm -hmm. um, and the same is true of coach, you know? Yeah. And so... I would encourage people, as boring as it is, read your informed consent when you sign up with anybody. Right. If you're not offered an informed consent, get out, <laughs> because that means you're kind of getting anything and everything. Uh, but they have to identify what they can and can't do in their scope of practice and their licensing body. Um, yeah, but the way they function is, is as a therapist, as a, as a counselor, they're going to do your therapy. Um, counselor and social worker are the terms that you're really looking for the most often. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the LCDC side, again, that's chemical dependency counseling. Those are people who have gone through specialized training to treat addiction and substance abuse disorders. So it's kind of one of these funny things. Any counselor can help you with your substance abuse. 
but the substance abuse counselor can't necessarily help you with your mental health issues, right? And so it's that's one a of very important factors. distinguish uh, distinguishing yeah. factor. Thank you for clarifying that. Because they've got counselor at the end of their name, so you would think, right? And so um, LCDCs, unless they're independents, right, uh, really shouldn't be treading too far into the let's work on your DSM mental health diagnosis. Let's deal with your depression. Let's deal. They can certainly work with your trauma as an adjacent to a contributing factor of your addiction. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really best left for the LPCs and the LCSWs, LSWs of the world. Um, LCDCs are more focused on the substance abuse training. And conversely, not to knock one versus the other, if you have a substance abuse issue, you may want to seek out an LCDC as opposed to an LPC because you have a specific identified issue and they're going to be right. best trained to address that. So it's a specialization. And I think, you know, I also in my podcast have, have kind of persistently said it's really important to look at people's last names and see what <laughs> abbreviations are there and what they mean because yes. that means what training they have it doesn't yes. really mean you're going to do a better job if you see a psychologist versus a, an LPC but it tells you what kind of experience they have in training mm -hmm. and then it tells you that they're legit versus someone who just says they're a therapist or a coach and I mean I do my share of uh, fair share of coaching as well but that's very different than providing therapy and counseling and very different than what our training is so um especially if you're working with kids and teenagers you want to make sure that you have a good one alliance and someone that you really like and they have training because you can like someone but if they don't have the training to help you they're not going to be able to get you to the next step well in the addiction world that what you're talking about there too is a sponsor right so like we have in the 12 step which mm -hmm. has been a really big help in terms of support groups for people in addiction, not therapy, right? Not clinical, but support, um, life-saving. I mean, 12 step people have said and continue to say that saved my life. Part of that is you get a sponsor and that's really somebody who acts in a therapeutic capacity, yes, right? Yes. Not as a therapist. right? Um, and so you may tell them your deepest, darkest secrets. You may feel like they are the person you are most comfortable and connected with, and they can be essential part of your treatment team and your support team. Um, but they're not, they're not licensed to offer actual therapy, uh, most of them, right? If they are, they're not doing it in the context of your sponsor. They should be your sponsor when they're your sponsor and your therapist when you're, they're your therapist. So that's important. And the thing about the sponsor thing is, it's so funny, is because the rapport is usually very high with a, with a sponsor. You yep. know what I've been through. Yep. You get me. You've been the, you know, in the same situation. But the informed consent in terms of the ability to treat is very low. It's support. Mm -hmm. And so you, you're exactly right, Dr. Naida. You have to find that balance. You have to find somebody that you like and can trust. And part of that trust issue should be trusting their competency and their education and their training. I agree. Totally agree. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I think I appreciate what you said, too, because it shares that and shows that people can be supportive and that has value just because you're not... Yes. a licensed therapist or psychologist or psychiatrist doesn't mean you can't help other people. You can, and mm -hmm. your presence and support could be life-saving, right? Could really change the trajectory of that person's life. And to do the work that needs to be done, we still need someone who can provide that guidance and that expertise. 100%. So, so you know, when would you advise that someone sees a supportive person versus a counselor versus hmm. a psychologist? What are some situations that you've had come up for you uh, and your clients where they might need a little bit of a different approach and um, you guided them through and navigated that? Yeah. So um, I'll share, I'll share a non-therapeutic approach to kind of like highlight the model, right? So uh, a couple of years ago, I had some back issues. I moved to New England and I thought I was a lumberjack and I started cutting down trees <laughs> in, my, in, my, in my property. And, and I woke up one day and I went, oh, this was a very, very, very bad idea, right? <laughs> and so there's a lot of options when you have a medical issue. One is to try to ignore it. I tried that first and it didn't work. And the other is to try to treat it yourself. And I did that with rollers and massagers and that made it worse, which can also happen when you try to treat your issues yourself yep. sometimes. So then I decided I needed some help. And so I had some options, right? I could go to a medical doctor uh, and get a diagnosis. I could go to a chiropractor um, and get an adjustment. Yep. I could go yep. to a physical therapist um, or I could go to my trainer at the gym and say, give me some stretches and some exercises yep. to decide what you want to do. It did not get better for me 
until I went through the experts first. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I got a proper diagnosis and I got an understanding of what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, not to share my, my tale of woe, but it wasn't just a, it wasn't just a, a muscle spasm. It was a structural issue that I've been carrying around my whole life mm -hmm. uh, that was just waiting to show up. And the chainsaw was the reason to show up. Right. So mm -hmm. I had to do some things. I had to work with a physical therapist for a while. I had to work with a chiropractor for a while. And now today I do nothing. I do my stretches and I work with a trainer and life is perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had skipped those initial steps, I would still be in pain today mm -hmm. because I would be poking around with people who couldn't properly diagnose the issue, right? Mm -hmm. So to answer your question and kind of come circle on that, I always say start with the experts first. Start with the, the trained and licensed folks first. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, to get a proper diagnosis and get a sober assessment of your situation, mm -hmm. right? And, and when should that happen? Well, that's the, that's the million dollar question for anybody seeking therapy or help, right? So sort of the standard answer is if it's causing issues for you on more days than it's not, time to get somebody involved, right? That's, that's a nice cool. rule of thumb. Um, you know, like if you think about anxiety, you know, well, I'm feeling sometimes, but you know, nine days out of 10, I'm fine. I just sometimes feel a little panicky. You're probably okay, right? But if it becomes a thing where it's every other day or you're, you're you know, parts of every day, and it's disrupting your normal functioning, it's time to get an assessment. Mm -hmm. And it's an important point that an assessment is not a life sentence. It doesn't mean, oh God, I'm going to sign up for the rest of my life. I'm right. going to therapy three times a week. I'm going to be spending $30,000 a year on, you know, on my mental health. No, you may be in a situation like I was with my back and earlier in my life of my anxiety, which is you will spend a period of time in intensive treatment, getting a grip on the situation and educating yourself. And then you'll go forward to your new normal life with these new skills and you'll be just fine. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I, you call it bias, call it experience. I think you always start with the professional. And then when you want to go to your coach or you want to go to your trainer, in my case, you go equipped with that strong knowledge and base of what's really going on here right. and how will your techniques or how will your advisements help me address these issues. Right. So like bad is not a diagnosis and better is not a treatment plan. You need to be specific mm -hmm. about what it is you're working on and also specific about what you want to change about your situation. That's when it's time to put the paraprofessionals involved, like the trainers and the coaches and things like that, to help you cross over and acquire those skills. And so that's been my experience. And I think that works well. Great. I think that's a great analogy. And I think it's <laughs> it's also significant that you mentioned pain. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you went through something that caused you substantial pain that was persistent mm -hmm. and whatever we're going through, mental or physical, if that causes us enough pain, however we describe that, it's yeah. definitely worth investigating. Yeah. And another advocacy point that I will just inject here is that when you see that expert, whoever they are, if they are a counselor, they're a psychiatrist, they're whoever they are, ask for your records, ask yeah. for your records for yourself, because yeah. what they say you have may not be what's actually written down. <laughs> and what's yeah, written right. down is what needs to go to the next person to help you. Yes. And sometimes there's so many things said, you can't always remember what that professional said. So always ask for your records. You know that they're yours. And if you see a mental health care professional like myself or Jason, know that nobody else can get those records, right? Yeah. You, there, there's a special protection against mental health records. So if you get a diagnosis of any kind of mental health care, no one else can go get them without your consent, without you signing off on them, whether they're your spouse or your mother. Um, children are a little bit different depending on the age of consent in that state. So in certain states, the age may be 16. In some states, they're not applicable. You have to be 18. Right. Um, right. So if you are a teenager getting help, depending on what state you're in, your parents can get your records. But point being, Get the documentation for yourself yes. so that you can use that going forward. Well, and I even used it just to close the, the loop on this. I even used it as a little bit of a competency test. Mm. I put my, I put my x-rays up in front of my chiropractor and I knew what the doctor had said that this was. Mm. And I said, what do you see? Mm -hmm. right? what, what, what would you do with something like this? Right. And, and I, and it's actually, it's funny. One, I was kind of like, you know, scratching his head and I don't know, that's not who I went with. Right. Yeah, I want yeah. somebody who could be aligned with my treatment team and goes, oh, well, it looks like you're dealing with an A, B and C. And what I would probably suggest I said, OK, this guy knows his stuff. I feel comfortable, right. you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes, because you want to feel that no matter what degree they have. Right. You want them to have a good degree, but also to communicate that to you and build that yeah. confidence within you. Yeah. Absolutely. To yeah. find the right fit for you. That's right. Absolutely. So tell me about your work. 
Um, who are the types of patients that you work with now? Which types of patients bring you the most joy, the most challenge? Mm. Yeah, so now it's less than it's ever been. I still see a handful of patients. I will be like total disclosure. I used to be the guy that would grind it out, do 80 hours a week of therapy. I mean, come one, come all. I would see everybody, um, you know, a new and my podcast and other ventures and my family have, you know, you, you only have so many pieces of the pie to hand out every week, yes, right? Yes, yes. Um, and so I do stay in, in contact and I do stay in session with some clients, but it's not been my typical caseload throughout my career. My typical caseload throughout my career, um, and with this I think goes back to your, your man up and your sort of like uh, gender issue. I, I tended to work with folks who had substance abuse issues with trauma or some other dual diagnosis issue. So it was, you know, substance abuse issues with depression or substance abuse issues with anxiety. Um, what I will say is 99 out of 100 times, it was all reactions to trauma. There's a lot of early trauma in substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people, I'm not the first person saying this, but, you know, there's a lot of people talking about how substance abuse is, is actually, you know, questionable as kind of a standalone disease. It's often a reaction to other factors. It's a coping me mechanism out of control. Mm -hmm. um, and so people like to talk about like heart disease as a corollary. It's actually a lot like obesity, right? So you, you start to eat to feel better. And then because you ate to feel better, you now have new problems because of the eating, right? So it becomes mm -hmm. its own thing. Um, and so what I got most times was teenagers and I got um, violent and emotionally unstable male and female adults. Mm. And the reason being is, uh, I don't know if you can tell because like this room is, is like really big, but like, like I'm like six, four and I kind of look like a football guy and, you know, like I'm still working out and stuff, still hanging in there. And so for every agency I ever worked at, it was like, look, I'm surrounded by women who may or may not feel as safe or even, you know, if things go bad, could I protect myself? Yeah. I'm in residential settings. I kind of look like a bouncer, uh, but I've got all, you know, <laughs> these degrees and a license. So they're like, Hey, if, if somebody's getting out of control, like put them on Jason's caseload. Right. And so uh, whether I was comfortable or not, I became comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, in that setting and learned how to work with that. Um, and what, what, what addicts and teenagers and emotionally unstable people all have in common is uh, they lack filters. And mm. so they can yes. say anything it's at any true. time. <laughs> <laughs> and they can feel anything. And you're going to know what they're feeling pretty yeah. much all the time because they're going to let you know. Um, and they're going to do stuff that if you look at it from the logical standpoint, uh, the adult perspective, doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, you oftentimes find yourself going, why would you do that? You know, when somebody, when a teenager breaks something or an adult, you know, gets their life together and then goes out on a bender and throws it all away, you know, a lot of people get to a place like, well, why would you do that? And so instead of judging that question, I got to a place where I just really got invested in that question. And I really wanted to understand on a deeper level, why would you do that? What did you get out of it? Yep. How does this make sense for you? Yep. Um, and what I found is when I really invested in curiosity around that question as a side for judgment around that question, the doors opened up, the walls came down, the rapport grew, and we were able to get a lot of good work done. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and so that became my most rewarding, my most rewarding clientele. Um, it was, again, my story is sort of similar. I didn't, I didn't grow up with a passion for substance abuse treatment. You know, when I got my master's degree, I applied at five different agencies, and I literally was like, well, the one I like the best. Right. And I felt most comfortable there. And then I invested in it and learned as I went. Um, I did have addiction in my family. Uh, there was a lot of drinking. Um, I've had siblings who had serious struggles with substance abuse. Um, there has been you know, some impact there, but that's almost every family at this point, mm -hmm. right? But it's like the Kevin, everybody's seven degrees from Kevin Bacon. Everybody's like one degree away from like addiction issues yes. nowadays, right? Yeah. It's yeah. either your family or a family you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I had things to connect to and I really got invested in that. And for me, what I liked the best was those groups of people seem to be kind of at their lowest point. You know, they talk about hitting bottom. Mm -hmm. And so when it clicked, there was a, a significant change between day one and, and when they were ready to discharge or when they got it and they got their life back together. It was like real significant growth you know it was and this is not a judgment but different people have different challenges right and so if you're you know if you're mildly depressed and then you're less depressed that may be a certain percentage 
if you're homeless and all your family won't talk to you and you're about to go to jail and now six months later your legal issues are resolved your anxiety is well managed you're not drinking and you go out and you get a home for the first time like i just felt like there were really significant tangible things to anchor to they're like wow this is working yeah um, so yeah that that was my population uh, still is in some way and that's why i found it so rewarding because I think there's a lot of ways to save a life that don't involve CPR or paddles, you know, I agree. And, yep. you know, and, and that was one of those ways that I felt like I could contribute and save some lives, save the lives of their children, because not only is there the life saving around this person's going to die right now without intervention, you also save them from the life they would have led if they didn't have that experience and that intervention, right? So that's where the multiplication of benefit comes in. Now they have a better marriage. Now their kids have their dad back or have their mom back. Now you're talking about a sort of generational impact to the work. And so it just, it just felt great. It just felt great when you could get somebody back on track. And so that's yeah. what I love. Yeah. You know, and sometimes we have no idea the impact we truly have on a person mm -hmm. and on a family. We just kind of hope and pray and work our best and plant mm -hmm. those seeds. But I think it's, uh, duly impactful no pun intended with dual diagnosis mm. because when you treat the substance use you also impact the mental health yes and when you impact the mental health you also help with the substance use yeah. so i will also now get on my soapbox about mental health and substance use because we as psychiatrists we are trained in mental health as well as substance use yes. substance abuse disorders are in the dsm-5 which is kind of like the psychiatric bible and yet so few of us are willing to deal with patients that have a substance abuse issue or will exclude working with those people when they have a substance abuse issue. And I think it's a kind of a double standard that we have in mental health care that we kind of siphon off uh, substance use into one particular area, but I'm having three cups of coffee a day. Mm -hmm. Most people are smoking weed on the weekend recreationally. Yes. yes. Most people are vaping. I mean, there's so much substance use that's in our everyday practice. Mm -hmm. Let's not even get to alcohol. Alcohol is so commonplace. Um, but we really need to, as you had said, with I think your analogy with obesity is a great one because that is this very similar to building a habit of mm -hmm. overuse of something that makes us feel good causing many long-term and sometimes lethal and fatal consequences yeah. if we do not intervene. Yeah, the maladaptive coping mechanism, right? So, you know, nothing, nothing in and of itself is good or bad. It's your relationship with it and the impact on your life that determines it to be so, right? So running is good. It's exercise and it helps you and you live longer and it's good for your heart. Running is good, right? But what if you run every day to the point where if you don't get your run in, you're cranky all day and you're mad at your spouse? Or what if you run so much that your feet start to break mm -hmm. under the pressure of the repeated stress, right? Mm -hmm. And you still run. And what if you run so much that if you're a female, you lose your period, right? And you, you know, it affects your cycle. And now what if you run to the point where, you know, if you don't get you know, 10 miles in on the weekend and, you know, whatever, you know, you're now angry with your children and you're mad at your spouse and you withdraw. So all of a sudden is running still good or is running bad, right? And it's kind of a niche example that tends to be the ultra marathoners that experience those kinds of things. But to your point of coffee, you know, uh, we, it's so, it cracks me up, Dr. Nadir. People joke about, don't talk to me till I've had my coffee. And I'm like, you're addicted <laughs> to caffeine. Like, right. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah, right. <laughs> It's like, um, ah, ah. So it's always that relationship. And I, and I, I do feel bad. I feel badly because what other health condition do you have to pass a moral test before you're allowed to receive care? Mm -hmm. And yet these folks show up in the emergency room, really uncomfortable, really sick. Mm -hmm. There are withdrawal symptoms that you can die from. Right. Yep. And, and I've heard it. People have said it. And if people are being honest, they'll, they'll, they'll know that they've probably thought this in their head. People go, well, there's a, there's a drug seeking junkie, you know, yep. oh, here they go again. Now, Jason's back. You know, right. Must be Friday night and he can't get his fix, right? right? It's it's like enough with all that stuff. You know what I mean? Like this person's in pain. And yes, I understand that doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results is not the way to go. But there's a clear need for intervention, right? Yeah. And to sort of layer that moral component in there, we just wouldn't tolerate it in any other field. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the dentist wouldn't not fill your cavity because you're like, well, you weren't, you weren't strong enough to not eat sugar, or not drink soda. They just, <laughs> right. Pain, right. But you're a bad person. Why are you eating that junk? 
okay, well, here we are with my cavity. I need, I need this fixed before I can do the rest. And your point is so good between the relationship between the two. You cannot get clean, right, without addressing your mental health issues. Yep. You also cannot properly address your mental health issues unless you're sober. Right. right? And so they, they have to work hand in hand. They have yeah. to. Yeah, and it's it's really hard because it's so difficult. It's hard to find mental health care treatment in general. It is oh, even yeah. harder for substance use, even harder. I mean, uh, in Arizona, I I asked about help to find uh, find help for a teenager with uh, a marijuana mm -hmm. use disorder. And aside from a high level of care, like an IOP, it was yeah. nearly impossible for me to find an outpatient psychiatrist who would treat this kid. I found one person and I was asking all over. So it's, it's really difficult. So I'm curious from your perspective with teenagers, because most of the people listening are parents of teenagers or teenagers themselves. Um, marijuana is everywhere, you know, yeah, yeah. it's everywhere. And we're talking about these extremes where, you know, they end up as adults in the emergency room, but it starts very young, you know, it starts even younger than when they, they start using. It starts with mm -hmm. those ACEs, those high adverse childhood experiences. It starts from the trauma. It starts from the feelings of inadequacy. It starts from trying to gain social mm -hmm. acceptance. It, all this stuff happens. And I think it's really challenging because especially with boys, right, manning mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. trying substances is almost a rite of passage. Yeah. Trying weed, trying your first blunt, having your first cigarette, your first drink, all of this is very socially pushed as who's cool, who's not cool. So I think it's a really challenging time for, for boys, for men, um, yeah. but at, at least with substance use for parents as well to know what is just trying mm. versus what is becoming addicted, what's becoming a problem. Yeah. And unlike the pain symptom where it's very clear this is causing some dysfunction, yeah. it is upsetting with substance you feel good right yeah. so you don't see it as a for problem a while. Much. for a while for a while for a while <laughs> um, so I'm, yeah. I'm curious if you can kind of shine some light on your patience yeah. your experience with this kind of gray zone uh especially with young people you, you ask such phenomenal questions um because there's so much i know so, there. so many different say. ways no <laughs> they, they, they're really good uh, first, it sounds like we need a new out in Arizona is what it sounds like to me. You don't have any. Yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> That's the first part. So we can talk about that a different time. Um, men need a rite of passage 100%. It has to be physical. It has to be tangible. It has to be activity based. And if we do not provide as a society opportunities for that to happen naturally, they will find ways for this to happen. And so it often involves risky behavior, right? And it often involves, you know, so sports filled a lot of that for me. There was definitely substance abuse in high school uh, that we called just being at a party, right? I mean, I never went to treatment or anything like that. Um, but, you know, you know, we fought, we, we punched each other, we hit each other on the football field, we were friends, we weren't friends. So there's, a, there's just a need, you know, in every culture, we have that rite of passage stuff and we've lost that. I mean, I don't want to be 150 years old on your podcast, but the digital age doesn't provide a lot of rites of passage. It's right? true. There's not much you can do on your computer screen to cross over that barrier from boy to man and learn the skills that you need. So that's probably a whole nother podcast, but we need to do better by our boys for sure. And I'll comment, I'll actually add in here. I think that's why there's some analogy between getting to the certain level, getting these number of likes, yes. like that is an analogy to getting to the certain acceptance, yes. crossing a threshold, dividing the, uh, what was it? Newbies, pros, gods, that yes. thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, to be a well, god, you have to get to that level. And, I, and you feel that, right? You get the same dopamine hit. It's just brief, you know, boom, I've accomplished it. But you're in a dark room and nobody's there to see it. And so what? You know, I mean, it's got to be, again, that's that tangible piece. There's nothing tangible or real about any of that. Um, the other thing I would say is parents and society as a whole, but we'll talk about parents since we're talking about kids. Mm -hmm. I feel they ask the wrong question, right? And so when you're setting up these habits, there's often this, well, it's not going to hurt. OK, having a couple beers, it's not going to hurt, you know, smoking some weed. It's not going to hurt um, all of a sudden the kids on heroin. Oh, my God, that hurts. Right. <laughs> the, the question we need to be asking is, how does this help? Right. Instead of hold, holding the question of how will this hurt him? Because I can talk myself into believing that nothing can hurt me. And at 16, I mean, I, you might have studied me in school. I was literally invincible, like nothing could hurt me at 16. Right. I was the only person ever that was literally invincible. Right. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. um, we all so thought it. We all thought it. So all this idea of will it hurt me is the wrong question. How does this help me? And that's where that habit formation you're talking about comes into play. 
-hmm. If you ask yourself in a sober, no pun intended moment about your children smoking weed, how does that help them, right? Now you've got a tougher question. You've got a longer road to rationalization if you ask it in that way, because it doesn't, it doesn't. And if it does, if you give me answers like, well, it helps them relax. Now we're back to my original question. Why would you do that? What do they need to relax from? Mm -hmm. Why does a child at 14 or 15 or 16 feel so stressed out that they need a chemical escape? Well, how are we structuring their life? What needs are not being met on their day to day that they're having to seek out a substance to address that? So um, I, I understand that I'm, you know, the old guy shaking my hands at the, the kids on my lawn, but I really worry about the lowering of expectation and the lowering of standards. You know, all this debate around making marijuana legal, which, you know, pretty much has happened across the board. I'm very concerned about it because I think it's a lowering of standards and it allows people to say, this doesn't hurt me so much easier, when in fact, there could be some real long-term consequences. A lot of the brain studies around marijuana, uh, marijuana use are not positive, mm -hmm. right? A lot of the long-term impact on all the things that it's supposed to be helping with in terms of feeling calm, and actually anxiety levels are higher in early marijuana users, mm -hmm. not lower. Long-term happiness, if you correlate the age of their first experimentation with long-term happiness, the earlier they use, the more unhappy they are when they're older. So all of this, you know, it won't hurt, is actually hurting our kids quite a bit. Um, and we have to be a little bit more careful with that because, you know, for me, back in my day, you know, people drank, but when you smoked weed, you were using drugs. Right. And so there were a lot of kids that were filtered out because like, I'm not a drug user. I just want to go to a party. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's changed. And now yeah. marijuana is on the just party inside of the equation. Yes. And now popping pills is on the just party inside of the equation. Right. So really for our kids to cross that conscience divide and that serious drug use divide, they basically have to stick a needle in their arm now, mm -hmm. right? Because that's where kids are. Well, that's a drug user. I mean, they're shooting up. Guys, you started using drugs long ago. You started using it with the alcohol, started using it with the marijuana, started definitely with the pills. And so, um, you know, it's just dangerous. It's just dangerous. And it is really, really tough to make the case that it helps them in any way. You know, if it was helpful to them, we'd be trying to find ways to get them to use drugs. Right. You know, we'd be like, why haven't you smoked weed yet? You're 13. You got to use drugs. It's so helpful. Nobody would ever have that conversation with their kids. Yet we have this, I don't want to say ability, but this willingness to kind of look the other way and go, ah, boys will be boys, just smoking a little pot. Uh, you know what? Sometimes that works out. A lot of times it does not. And if it doesn't help, why have it in your kid's life? I just, right. I just have a hard time answering that question. And, you know, I do acknowledge that for you and me, we see the kids where it doesn't work out, right? We mm -hmm. see that subset. Mm -hmm. And no parent wants to go to any of us, right? Like, we don't want you <laughs> to get to us. We want yeah. you to avoid us. Yeah. So although, you know, I'm not trying to be completely negative, I'm trying to be forewarning. And the other thing I will, I have noticed as a child psychiatrist working with parents since there's been more legalization is the increased volume of parents with medical marijuana in their home yes. and openly using That's marijuana right. in their home. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying saying this in a judgmental way. I'm saying this in a conscientious way as parents. Mm -hmm. If we use things like, for example, my kids know I don't drink during the week, but on the weekends, yes, I have a glass or two of wine. That sure. is pretty typical. Sure. So they expect me now, right, to have a glass of wine. So when I don't, they're like, what's wrong, mom? are you okay like what's happening <laughs> i don't always want to have a glass of wine but they right. know saturday is the day that i'll have a glass of wine yeah. um so the kids observe us all of the time That's all right. of the time and they come to see what we do as normal yeah. for everyone not just us everyone's normal is mom's going to have a glass of wine on saturday yeah. that sounds horrible with me saying it but you know this is the yeah. reality in my home um but think about when your kid is observing you using marijuana or you have a gummy and you think they don't know the difference but they do see they observe that difference and if they know that you have it they also know where you have it that's right i'm bringing that to your attention because i say all the time for suicide prevention one of the most important things you can do is mm -hmm. lock up your alcohol mm -hmm. forget the pills alcohol yeah. is a comorbidity with yeah trying to attempt because it causes disinhibition it causes liquid it's liquid courage right yeah. and they know where your stash of alcohol is it's almost always readily available and 
typically between 30 to 50 percent of teenagers that come into the hospital with a suicide attempt are blood alcohol positive. Yes. So we have to watch our alcohol if we're trying to prevent suicide in our homes. But um, why am I bringing this up? Oh, I'm bringing this up because of legalization and the volume of parents I've, I've heard discuss this. So I think kids have it more readily available on many different fronts, not just their friends, but in their home. Well, and, and let's be real too. I mean, parents have to understand that they're using those substances with a 30 to 35 to 40 to 50 year old brain. That is a much different thing yes. in a 13 to 14 year old brain. Absolutely. Okay? We all talk about neuroplasticity and how the brain is not even finished developing until 25. That's just structural. That's not the neural connectivity stops at 25. That's the structural size and weight and, you know, and the development you have there. So, you know, putting our kids in positions or opening up opportunities and for them to, to take on things that they're not maturity wise or brain development wise, don't even take it from a, a moral standpoint, like should or shouldn't brain wise, it's just not there for them yet. They're not ready to deal with that in the same way. And that's your recipe for trauma. I mean, right. how many of our trauma cases are, I was thrust into a situation that I just was not developed enough to handle. And now I'm going to carry that around with me for the rest of my life until I can process it and deal with it as an adult. And of course, when we're talking about things like sex and violence and things like that, it's like, well, duh, of course, that's very traumatic. But, you know, these chemicals interact, like I said, with a 12-year-old brain much different than a 24 or 42-year-old brain. So you're introducing trauma, throw in your disinhibition. Now I'm going to put myself in riskier situations. Uh, you know, how much of date rape statistics involve alcohol use, how much of early sexual experiences, which can be traumatic, anything that they're dealing with before they're ready is a huge opportunity and precursor for trauma. So I just think recognizing, you know, the drugs have changed, fentanyls and all of it, one use can kill you. So the scary stuff aside, marijuana is stronger than it's ever been. Their access is different. I mean, I had to go get beer from the corner store if the guy would like buy my fake ID and luckily I was tall, so he did. Now with the internet and social media, like the access is unlimited. Yeah. It's yep. more prevalent in your homes. Um, in that regard, it's a very dangerous time uh, to be a kid. I mean, it really is because there's no going back. Once that trauma has seeded, you can't say, oh, no, okay, lock up all the alcohol and all the bad stuff will just go away. No, there's some experiences and some damage that we have to deal with now. Right. So we've talked a bit about parents and substance use yeah. and what they can do. But of course, the teenage brain, we talked about that too, being 16 and 17 and invincible. For me, it was 17. 17 was my perfect age. I could do anything. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so how do you work with these teenagers who are vaping yeah. and anxious and yeah. smoking weed and anxious and depressed, and they don't want to quit? They don't see a problem in it. They feel good when they use it because that's where the parents struggle and come to me. How do I get my kid to stop because they don't see it as a problem? Yep. Yep. So, and it, I will I'll, I'll warn you, if you wade into these waters, it's, it's not easy. And working with a child, uh, you remember those old finger cuffs where you stick your oh, finger yeah, yeah. on the side <laughs> and you can pull, it gets tighter. Yes. Yes. That is trying to force change on an adolescent. Yeah. If you were trying to rip something out of their hands, you, they are going to hold it tighter than you can ever believe. Yeah. And so what, what it is, is, is back to those original questions is, without judgment, getting to a place of understanding what need this is meeting, right? Like, what is it that you are benefiting from by doing this? Um, does it help reduce your anxiety? Okay. Uh, does it help you feel more comfortably social? Because they've got emerging and developing social skills, right? We've all heard of liquid courage and, you know, have a couple of drinks and now I can talk to that person that I think is kind of cute, you know? Right. So without judgment, without the you're a bad kid, without the, because that's the number one thing the kids are sensitive to is judgment. Um, mm -hmm look at a teenager too long and watch how they react, you know, what, you know, like it's all defensiveness. And so um, you have to be able to, in a non-judgmental non -judgmental way, get to a place where you can understand why, what need does this meet? And then you've got an opportunity because if there are ways to get that need met that don't involve the downsides of all the substances, then you've got a shot at it, right? The other thing is something that kids have that we all have is they have goals and they have dreams and they have wants. And so they're never going to quit for your reasons. You might as well not even share them, yeah. you know? Yeah. Oh, I wanted this for you, Jason. It would be so great if you like, I mean, that's the, uh, that's the varsity blues scene where he goes, I don't want your life, right? Like that's your dreams are not going to be theirs. They don't want them that thanks for sharing, but they have dreams of their own. 
And I can promise you their drug use is not helping them reach those dreams. It's not helping them build the life that they want. Drugs just turn the volume up on what you like or turn the volume down on what you don't like. Mm. And so they're turning the volume down on something that you need to help them resolve, or they're turning the volume up on things that they're trying to pursue. And if you can teach them as a parent and educator, how to reach those goals in a better way, a more efficient way, in a less risky way, you'd be surprised at how much they can anchor to this new process and how quickly they'll go, oh, okay, that's better, right? Like I can just do it easier and get there faster, but it's got to be theirs, right? And so, so much of this, I mean, if you want to do the kind of Yahoo News bullet points is you've got to stay judgmental or non-judgmental. You've got to stay non-judgmental and just be curious. Um, you've got to connect this to their wants and their goals, mm -hmm. not yours. Whether you think they have, and I'll just say it plainly, whether you think they have the dumbest goals and, and that, that isn't going to work. Yeah. You're not going to be a DJ at a zoo. That's ridiculous. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it does sound kind of cool. I'd go to a zoo with a DJ, but like, you know, you can't judge it. You just got, okay, well, that's great. I'm going to help you get there, but we're, but this isn't the way, you know? Right. Um, if you do that, and then the third thing I would say, which is probably the most important thing, is to lay that foundation early. Um, you know, if you only talk to your kids when you have a problem, you're going to have a problematic relationship with your kids. Mm. You've got to talk to them all the time. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be really curious and you've got to be understanding. I mean, from age one on, as soon as they start babbling, they got something to say. I'm not saying you have unlimited time, but you have to show real interest. Even if you're carving out, you know, 10, 15 minutes a day, that's 10 to 15 minutes a day. They can count on that you're going to connect with them and genuinely be curious about what's interesting to them. Good, bad, and ugly. So that's going to help you so much uh, because that's going to open up those avenues of communication that will help number one and number two become possible for you. And it's it's making me think about something that I, I did not mean to share, but I'm going to share. So I have a, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old and my five-year-old talks nonstop, nonstop. He wakes up <laughs> five in the morning, he is going. So I have caught myself as he's talking, being distracted, right, by my uh, phone. So yeah. one day he comes up to me, he's like, mom, you know, um, sometimes I talk to myself because I know you're really busy and you can't hear me. Oh my God, this is devastating for me. Right in the heart, right in the so heart. Because I also do listen to him and pay attention to him. So what I've started to do was have him see me put my phone down and close my laptop. He's five, right? Concrete. And say, yeah. Dylan, this is your time. This is mom and your time. And I'm hugging him and I'm listening. Yes. Every day, I'm trying my best. And when the time comes later on in the day where he's talking and I'm not listening, I remind him, like, Dylan, we had mom and Dylan time. I'm going to come back to you, but now I have to do work, right? So we have to, and I bring this up because very often I hear parents of teenagers saying, but I am listening to them. And yes. I, I, everything I do is for them. My whole life revolves around yeah. them. And yeah, you think a five-year-old is needy? A teenager is way more needy <laughs> than my five-year-old Dylan, which you know, right, parents? But I think sometimes we really have to underline it and highlight it and remind them that, yes, we are yeah. here for you. Yes, we've spent that time. Yeah. We have our own time. But remember, I did spend this time with you. So if you kind of highlight it and mark it, that helps solidify it for them to remind them that yes, you did devote this time to them. Rituals matter. Consistency matters, you know, yeah. and it doesn't have to be 24 seven. Like I think about your son, you know, if you walked out of a therapist's office and they said, no matter what, no matter when, you've got to stop everything you're doing and listen to him. Like it would be like, this is not helpful advice, you know, because it's just not, it's not, it's not logistically possible. Like, you know, all the parents have to work. Yep. That uses up a lot of time. We're in a digital age. I mean, you know, we're connecting right now via our computer. So you're never really off work, right? Because right. your computer can reach you. Your phone can reach you. But I love that ritual of like making a display out of like the phone goes down. You have, because I think faces matter. Yes. They've got to see your face and you've got to see theirs. I think eyes matter. And I think touch matters. I really Absolutely. do. I think, uh, and, the, and, and please stay with me because it can sound weird at first. I think you should be touching your kids all the time whether it's bumping my son in the hallway, grabbing him on the shoulder, bringing him in for a hug, holding my daughter while I'm listening to her. Uh, you've got to literally make connections and make contact with your kids on a regular basis because that communicates safety. Like if I'm hugging my son, I'm not, it's not possible for me to do anything else, right? So he knows I've got, you know, he's got my full attention right then. 
Um, you know, yeah, and so I, there's no perfect way, but I think those are some guidelines that will help you form those connections that when things go bad, you're going to desperately wish those roads were already dug and in yes. place. You're going to want to reconnect with them when things go bad. You better do the groundwork early. You're not laying the initial groundwork in the middle of a crisis. It's not possible. Right, because right now, uh, you know, at, at this developmental stage for for my kids, they mm -hmm. want to talk to me. Yeah. When they're and that's their sim symptom, their their signal to me, right? Mom, 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 yeah. mom. Yeah, yeah. They're in my face. But as a teenager, their signal that they want to talk to me is the opposite. Yeah. Them yeah. retreating is actually yeah. a signal. Mom, yeah. come and find me. Mom, show me that I'm that important that you'll stop what you're doing to come and see me. Versus, I think a lot of parents take that as they just need their time. They mm. want alone time, which is which is also true. Yeah. But you yeah. still gotta check in on them just because they're it's by easier. themselves it's doesn't easier. mean they don't want you. Right. Think about it. just human nature. It's easier, you know. If they're good, I can do my stuff. We're good. Like right. it's okay. But be careful that insidious space that's growing in between you and your child because there are elements in the world. We're not doing fear mongering. It's not a scary place. It's a wonderful, lovely place. But uh, there are elements out there that'll be very happy to take up that space for you. Uh, you know, influences that you wouldn't necessarily wanting to have their attention, you know what I mean? So uh, it's that old line about like, if you don't talk to your kids about drugs, someone will, uh -huh. right? And yeah. so you'd rather it come from you. Right. And then, then if you think you should be talking to your kids about X, you should have started five years ago. Yeah. You're too late. You're already late. I'll tell you that. And if you, if you, as a parent, if, I always tell them, if you know something, whatever, you know, there's, there's 50% more you don't know. I right. promise you. I promise you. Yeah, just stay and connect, stay con stay connected. Going back to the teens and substance use, though, I want to ask you one more question that I think is yeah, unique please. to a counselor and a male counselor um, than a psychiatrist. You know, because my job is kind of with uh, the current mm -hmm. state of mental health affairs is just prescribed to prescribing, right? Yeah, Prozac yeah. is my thing. But <laughs> even though I can do way, way more than that, that's what they course, expect me to do. So they're so I find patients are not always completely honest with me when it comes to mm -hmm. thinking about meds, talking about meds, even though I'm one of the psychiatrists who do not push meds at all, as you know. Yeah. So many teens will say, Doc, I don't want to use medication. I want to do it by myself. And they're smoking weed every day to survive. <laughs> and they're vaping every day to survive. Yeah. My sense is that these kids are more honest with, with the counselor, with you. How do you guide these kids? Not to say they need to be on medication, but the, the hypocrisy that we know teenagers are full of. Yeah. But how do we get them to see that they are depending on something, even yeah. if it's not a prescription? So um, I have found there to be no value in proving a teenager wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yes. So uh, I would say just let them be wrong about the things that they're wrong about, right? As long as it's not life threatening, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, with certain things like that. And again, um, find ways for them to connect with what you see as a better path for them as the right way. Um, and analogy and humor and all that kind of stuff is really key. You know, if you take the stress out of the room, it, it just becomes like a car ride with us sitting side to side, right? They're going to be more likely to talk to you. There's no judgment. There's no pressure. There's no consequences. For parents trying to play kind of like pseudo therapist, like that's a big thing is like, you know, we're going to take the consequences off the table. Like I'm just here to understand, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think that for me, you know, when you said that, like, I, I don't, I want to do it on my own. I would always interject a little humor and say, yeah, no, I totally get it. When I broke my leg, I wanted to walk out of the hospital, but I, I needed those crutches for a couple of weeks. Yeah, that's you know a good what I mean? And so giving other examples where the thing is temporary, and that, that's a key lesson for teenagers all together is that really, in a lot of ways, everything's temporary. The good's temporary, the bad's temporary, your use of this drug is temporary, your smoking is temporary, everything's temporary because sometimes, and you talked about suicide earlier, they can become desperate because they think that how they're feeling now is how they're going to feel forever. Absolutely. Right. You know, and so he just broke up with me. My heart is broken. I'm never going to be OK. There's a lot of black and white and absolute yep. Yep. speech. And so for me, it's always about don't you know, this is a derogatory term. Don't wrestle with pigs. Right. You just get dirty and they just like it. So there's no reason to prove a teenager wrong. That's not a thing you're going to win. Um, so let them have it there and then shrink the ask shrink the change as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. I'm in total control. I can quit this anytime. Cool. Just do it for today and tell me how you feel. Mm. I accept everything you say is true. Okay. 
you know, and then here comes, you know, but, 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 but. And then you have to be kind of like, this is a really old reference, but you have to be kind of like Columbo and go, huh, if you told me that you could stop any time, but now you're mad at me because it's like one day, what do you think about that? Help me understand that, right? So you don't want to feed them knowledge. You want them to help arrive at that knowledge and understanding on their own. So those leading questions, indirect interventions are really, really important. Mm -hmm. And keep it small. That, I mean, if I only had the one piece of advice is just keep it, keep it small. Like if you can do less, you can eventually stop. Right. If you can't even do less, then as your parent and a, and a person who loves you, we may have to look at a larger intervention, Right. So now it's like, well, no, I'll stop to prove to you that I don't need a larger intervention. Cool. I accept that. I celebrate that. That's awesome. You, you really didn't. You know, you don't go search. You don't drug test. You didn't all day long. You didn't smoke. Amazing. Can you do two? Can you do two days? You know what I mean? And just yeah. keep it one step at a time um, because you want to give them an identity to live up to, right? Not avoid that negative, you know, bad feeling that they're having about themselves. Um, so just, just keep it small and reinforce what you want to see. There's a natural inclination to reinforce what you want to see and punish what you don't. So reward the good thing and punish the bad, mm -hmm. which I understand undeveloped brain again, mm -hmm. that punishment is just another form of attention. Right. So you're actually inadvertently reinforcing it a lot of times. So you actually, again, when safety is assured, so I'm not talking about things that are unsafe, like suicide and things like that. I'm talking about developmental things. You really want to invest in a strategy of rewarding what you see and kind of ignoring what you don't. You don't have to win every battle. You don't have to fight every fight. You know, it's like, okay, you know, we talked about this. I had hoped that you would do better. I believe that you will tomorrow. And let's talk about it. Then, you know, that's a lot different than screaming and yelling and reinforcing that idea as a failure. And you told me you weren't going to use, and you're a liar. And, you know, I can't believe this. You know, you betrayed me. You've let me down. You break my heart. I can't, this is not the life I want to be. They don't want any, none of that connected. I mean, you're just throwing Hail Marys and none of those landed, yeah. right? I love you and I believe in you and I believe you'll do better tomorrow. Tell me how I can help you do that. That's going to go a lot farther than the, the dramatics and the theatrics. But as a parent, I get it. You're scared. You're scared. When you find the drug use, you're terrified. They're going to overdose. They're going to die. They're going to be an addict for the rest of their life. As an adult, recognize that fear response, get help and support that you need, mm -hmm. right? Because the only thing you're going to do is sit there and argue with your kid about their drug use. Right. You guys are in for some really bad times. Right. Get the help and support that you need. There's a lot of support groups out there, Al-Anon, things like that. Find your own therapist, find other parents, get your support, deal with that fear and help your child move forward. Like just tiny steps, one little step at a time and understanding that every step is a big deal. You know, it really is. The other thing I would add in there uh, along the lines of, of advice for parents who may have someone, uh, a child who's dealing with substance use is getting to know their friends. Oh, it's yeah. Really important to get to know your kids' friends, even if they're using, mm -hmm. because if that kid ends up overdosing and your kid is the one trying to help that kid, that's a whole other thing. So you want to know who their friends are. You want to um, know who their parents are. Get to know their extended support system beyond you. And their friends will sometimes be the ones who will tell you that it's gotten out of control and we yes. are dealing with a safety issue. Yes. Hey, J I was hanging out with Jason last night and I got to tell you, I'm starting to get worried about him. Yeah. That comes from the friends all the time. And again, if you haven't done your work early, non-judgmental and built those relationships, they won't tell you that. And then right. now we've gone from a developmental issue to a safety issue. So right. that's a great point. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. So, uh, you know, here we're talking about these teenagers and I'm, I'm just thinking about boys, right? I have two boys, yeah. but I'm thinking about boys. So let's talk about boys, boys and men in yeah. mental health care. Why are there so few of you, Jason? We know you're a rare bird. Why is it so hard to get guys interested in being therapists, interested in doing this work? Because yeah. we need, we need you guys. We need more of you really. Male nurse, male teacher, yeah. male therapist, yeah. right? All that yeah. stuff. Um, you know, it's not, it's not something as I remember that was really ever even presented as an option. I kind of had to find my own way to it. Um, and I sort of did, like I said, somewhat accidentally. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't really think that we can force anything on these kids, but just even when it's discussed, representation in media, examples. I mean, I joked about watching Growing Pains and seeing Mike Sieber's dad, but I did see that and I remember it now, right? Mm -hmm. um, I remember Robin Williams. I remember these portrayals of it. And so 
Um, we know we talk a lot about female empowerment and awesome as well. We should I have a daughter, you know, I've got a wife, I've got a mom, I'm all for it. Let's go. Um, you can do anything, right? But but so can we, you know, yes. and we have to make sure that those are put. It's like a buffet. It's got to be on the list of offerings. It's got to be the things that's talked about. It's got to be something that we bring up. And I don't think you get at it by courting men into being therapists necessarily as much as you do is creating environments where men feel comfortable communicating mm. that's the that's the number one skill right is yeah. being able to communicate give and receive express empathy right. right when all of those things are taught that there are signs of weakness uh that you're a bad word that you're you know maybe you're homosexual or why are you being soft or why are you being when that kind of messaging gets sent this way I mean, you'd have to be kind of a crazy person to push through that and still, you know, express yourself or communicate in that way. Right. right. So I think it's less about, you know, job training and like, hey, guys, let's recruit you to be a therapist, because I'll be honest, we have a therapist shortage, period, much less the ratios around men. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so we've got a, we got enough trouble there that we've got to sort out. And um, we've got some thoughts on that. But for me, it's allowing men to understand and shifting the conversation and we talk about reducing the stigma reduce the stigma around open communication for men mm. right reduce the judgment of that encourage that allow that reward that and as you get better communicators as men you will get more male therapists you'll get more people in those helping caring cultivating positions because you know and this is for all guys listening when you start sharing your feelings you actually start to be more empathetic of other people's feelings. You connect to the larger universe in a better and more deeper way. Um, you can receive the signals. Like I understand my wife, my marriage is better because I work as a therapist without a doubt, without a doubt, because I know how to listen and I know how to pick out what, what is she really saying here? You know, what's the need that's not being met? Um, I'm able to walk in the house and something's up and pick up on energy, feel it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. um now she'll tease me and be like oh don't do that therapy crap on me you know, <laughs> be careful with your techniques uh, but, but the listening and you know and allowing for that and just allowing men to communicate and I, i'll be honest with you it's it's the existing men it's our job to allow that communication to happen you know your mom coming to you and saying honey it's okay if you share your feelings again that's not who he needs to hear the message from mm -hmm. he needs to hear it from the coach he needs to hear it from the strong guy. He needs to hear it from the masculine man. He needs to hear it from dad. He needs to hear it from brother. You know, no, no, bro. I want to hear from you. Come on, finish what you're saying. I want to right. hear the rest of that. That must and be I, tough. And I think that goes back to sports because sports mm -hmm. really provides an opportunity for a positive male influence other than your dad to listen to you, to hear you, to see you, to acknowledge you, to see your value. Yep. I think that is such an important part of um, yeah. being on a team and having a coach. Yeah, sports are great. I mean, even even if you suck at them, I, I, sports saved my life and a lot of my friends' life. Being part of bigger something bigger than yourself and yes. find your tribe. You get a male role model. I didn't really have, like I said, a lot of my, so I had uncles and grandfathers. I did not have a father in the home. So there were a shortage of male role models close at hand. Um, you know, there that was where I got all of that was, was on the field. And I mean, again, I was lucky enough to be decent, um, you know, but even even the guys who, you know, aren't in the starting lineup, get so much benefit. I think all the best and, and worst of life can be found in athletics. I'm a big fan, mm -hmm. um, not just even because like meathead, rah, rah, go play football, but just for like personal development, um, that, that's, that's our coliseum, you know, that's our gladiator training. That's where we can do our rites of passage. Uh, you make a play and your buddies come over and slap you on the back and say, great job. And all athletes will tell you this, it's not so much the stuff on the field that you miss, it's the locker room. It's the training before and after. It's the travel to and from. It's the group of friends. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's where that communication that I was just talking about, that's where that happens. You yeah. know? So yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Big fan. Oh my God, Jason, I could talk to you forever, but yeah, I can't take it. up all of your time. It's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you're, yeah, thank you for working me into your schedule. That's an oh, honor. Oh, no, absolutely. Is there anything on any of these topics you feel like is left unsaid or that you feel like the listeners really should should hear about? Talk no, about there, there, there's just so, there's so much, there's so much. Um, but I guess if we're talking about addiction specific and we're talking about teenagers, I guess my number one uh, comment would just be don't wait. You know, as a parent, you may not have all the tools, you may not have all of the answers, but you have your instincts. 
And, uh, you know, very rare is the family that I brought into treatment that they go, I was completely surprised. They may not, they may be surprised by how big of a problem it was, but they all knew something was up and they all knew something was changing, you know? And I go back to my story about my back, you know, if your instincts are telling you something, listen to those instincts, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, do not wait to act. Behavioral health is such a weird field. I'm sorry, I got emails coming through. I'm trying to get rid of them. I hope you don't see them. Um, behavioral health is such a weird field. In no other health discipline do we sit around and go, I don't know if I'm hurt enough to go get help. We go, I feel like I'm hurt. I need to make sure it's not so bad. And we go get checked out and we move on with our life, right? But behavioral health, we have this weird thing where we're just like, well, is it bad enough? Is it bad enough? Do we really need to go to a therapist now? Do I really need to see a psychiatrist? I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I have to take six Benadryl to fall asleep and then I have to drink a monster energy to start my day and I can barely breathe out the way, but I don't really know. I mean, I'm not, I don't, not that bad, man. It, it's not about being so bad. It could be so much better. So just don't wait, you know, get your assessment and go home and do no treatment. At least, you know, at least, you know what you're dealing with, right? Uh, go talk to a drug counselor, bring in your, bring in your teenager who won't speak to you and has their hoodie up like this and headphones on put them in my office for, out, for an hour. I'll get them talking. We'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. I won't get all the answers, but we'll get something. Yeah. Um, and just don't wait because I just, you know, this is one of those kind of like philosophical things, but I've been through this a couple of times in my life and I'm telling you, there's nothing worse than too late. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than I should have. Now something's happened and now I can't. Right. You know what I mean? You'll never, ever, ever for myself and for my clients, I've seen this, you'll never get over too late. So don't wait, don't let it be too late, you know, go say the thing that you've been waiting to say. Uh, if you are scared for your child, get help, bring them in. If you need help for yourself, or you just feel like something's going on, get in and find out. The worst thing can happen is that you, you learn that the answer is yes, there is something going on. But behind that yes, are so many more options to restore your freedom, right? Help is behind that, that yes. Right. The best thing that can happen is, is somebody like Dr. Naidu or myself says, I think you're good, actually. You know what? There's some stuff there and we can do A, B, and C, but honestly, you're, you're doing pretty good. So there's really We're no happy problem. to say. <laughs> we are yes. happy to say. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, yes. And so just don't wait. Just don't wait. Trust your instincts and don't wait. You know yeah. something's up. Come talk to us. And that you don't have to see a psychiatrist or a counselor. Hmm. You can start with your PCP. You can start yeah. with your pediatrician. You can start with your school counselor. You yeah. can start with a guidance counselor. You can start with your pastor. You don't have to start with a psychiatrist. You can just start with someone yeah. and keep at it. Because when you want to get to us, it mm. is a wait. So sure. when you wait for a crisis, mm. you're going to be waiting at least three months yeah. to a year to get into one of us. So don't wait. So I, I think that's fantastic. All yeah, right. You, don't have to be alone. you definitely don't have to be alone. And yeah. I, I love that you also said that instinct. I think that parental mm -hmm. instinct, you know, none of us were trained in being mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. It was training on the job, right? Apprenticeship, <laughs> even though we saw Terrifying. our parents. Um, <laughs> but there is that instinct within us, that that mama bear, papa bear that lives, that yeah. breathes, that feels for our kids. And we have to trust that right. um, and honor that. So I think it's Definitely. great that you said that too, because that that's more valuable than any medical degree, right? 100%. That instinct telling you something's up. I need to- Well, we can't do it without you. We're not going to come pick up your kids. They changed the laws. We're not going to come pick them up in a white van. It has to start with you. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So how can our listeners get in touch with you? Yeah. So uh, the easiest way, um, so is obviously through the podcast. Uh, so through Helping Back um, is, a, is the podcast that we're on all platforms streaming. We also have a YouTube channel. So uh, helpingback.com is the website there. Um, a new behavioral health is also one of my companies. So a N E W B H.com. Um, and you know, so if you want to get to me personally, you can go either one of those routes. There's people that will, will connect you to me. Um, I don't do personal social media. I just don't, you know, I do it for my, for my business and my podcast. I, I'm a bad dancer, so I'm not on TikTok. So I mean, I guess <laughs> you're just going to have to do it one of those two ways. So that's well, his best. podcast is fantastic. Please, please do take a listen. All sorts of people are on there. All sorts of topics. You know, please take a yeah. listen. It's, it's very refreshing. Fun. So we're and Dr. Knight is on there. One of the best episodes we've done. Oh. Was yours. I mean, it was, <laughs> you did. A, I mean, you're very humble, but you did a fabulous job. It was a great episode. So if anybody's checking out the podcast. Start, start with Dr. Naidu's episode. She, she crushed it. She did great. Aww, thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. Of course. So we'll do our rapid end 
which is kind of answering in it very quickly. So mm -hmm. what are the top three things you wish you knew before you became a counselor? Um, but top three things that I wish I knew. It's going to be extremely hard, but it's also going to be worth it. So don't give up. Uh, that's number one. It's going to be very, very, very hard. You're going to cry in the car. You're going to, you're going to feel, it. Um, but, it, but it is so worth it. Um, invest in yourself. Do not let off of the self-care. Do not let off of supporting yourself. You know, make those daily, if you can, weekly, but make, continue making those invest, investments. If it's working out, if it's yoga, if it's meditation, if it's connecting with family, friends, you're investing everything in your clients. Do not stop investing in yourself. You're going to need those resources for sure. And then the third thing is, is the best way to not burn out is to continue to develop. So continue to challenge yourself, uh, take CEU classes, uh, audit courses at universities. The internet is out there. Check out podcasts, continue to learn, uh, go get a certification in hypnosis, um, try EMDR, like just add tools to your toolbox, even if you never use them. Um, it will stimulate you brain development wise. We talked about that, but just never stop developing because if you no matter what you're doing and how much you love it at first, if you're going to do the same thing over and over and over for the rest of your life, you're going to feel that too. Uh, so continue to expand and continue to develop. I just want to interject, which I don't typically do, but in this area, but um, one of the rite of passages of being a good therapist, counselor, mental health care provider is having yep. that breakdown in the car. Burn out. Yep. That is the rite of passage. <laughs> Getting in your car and be like, oh my God, I feel it. <laughs> my chest. I always felt it in my chest. I mean, yeah, I, was just, like, I was breathing through a straw, man. Just like, you know, so, yeah. yep, you don't have to go through that. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Best advice you've ever been given. Best piece of advice. Oh, my gosh. That's a tough one. Um, I've had a lot of good people in my life. I've had a lot of good mentors and, uh, and things like that. I mean, I would just say, you know, this comes from the sports world is winners are the people who don't quit. You know, that's really what it comes down to. Um, that can mean anything for anybody. It can mean a lot of different things. And that's probably why I like it. Um, but it's not in striking out seven out of 10 times or eight out of 10 times. It's in the courage to get back up there and do your best the next time. Uh, so if you want to win, uh, just continue, just, just don't quit. It does change and it does get better. Uh, if you can finish these couple of sentences, the most important thing in life is. Most important thing in life is your tribe. And for me, that's my family. Find where you connect. The most rewarding thing about being a counselor is? Um, when it works. When a, when a client comes back in and says, you might not remember me, and you're like, I know your name right now. Because I, <laughs> they're like, you might not remember me, but hey, here's my kids. Here's my job. Look at the new car I bought. I've got a house now. Oh, yes. I just wanted you to know that you were part of that. And, it, and, and God has a way, y'all. They, they come in right when you're like, where, right when you need it, right when you need it the most. Someone's going to show up and say, you made a difference. And it just, there's nothing like it. Absolutely. The most rewarding thing about being a podcaster is all the amazing people I've gotten to meet. I've, I, I, I've talked to people, I think on like five different continents. Now I connected with people who have grown up in Paris, people who've grown up in Dublin. Um, I'm, I'm nobody from nowhere. I, I grew up in Xenia, Ohio, which is a wonderful small town in the middle of Ohio. And uh, I get to meet everybody. I get to hear these amazing stories and even though they're all over the place and they're so different, what I've been struck by my, my year and a half in podcasting, I think we're like, I don't know, 60 or 70 episodes in, um, just how, how similar we all are, how much, how, how there's so many places for us to connect, um, despite all that diversity of experience yeah. and diversity in every way possible. Um, so that, that feels good. I've got a little map with flags where the people are from, you know? And my, my world is expanding because of that podcast. And it's just been an honor to, to hear the stories and to learn how, how much we're just all the same. Yeah. The most rewarding thing about founding a mental health care clinic is. Yeah, this is going to be such a guy answer. Uh, multiplying your impact. When I was a therapist, I was going to see everybody, right? And even when I was grinding myself and ruining my own relationships and sacrificing my health, I was seeing like 70 to 80 people a week. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a new sees thousands of people every month and I'm not in those sessions, but I help with the policies. I help with the culture. I help develop that. And so just from a simple math standpoint, the amount of lives you can touch by challenging yourself and expanding yourself, it's pretty cool. It's pretty overwhelming. So that's the impact is the best. Awesome. Yeah. I wish my struggling patients, clients knew. 
you will not feel like this forever. It's going to change. If I could wave the magic wand and they would trust that, that the way you're feeling now is not, is not a life sentence. It is not going to be how you feel forever. On the positive side too, because in early recovery, they call it the pink cloud, right? You start to feel healthy. You start to get some nutrition. You're not in jail. All right, I got a job. And you start thinking, I'm done. I'm done working on my recovery. I feel good now. Right. No, 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 sir. You're not going to feel like this forever. So it's kind of that this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. um, people, you know, and I, I share on my podcast, we didn't talk about it much today, but my own struggles with anxiety and things of that nature. If I had known that to my core in the midst of my anxiety, I would have had a much different experience. But there were days that I woke up and I was like, I, I can't. You know, I was never suicidal, but I was like, I can't feel like this forever. I right. cannot feel like this forever. Something's got to change. It will change. It always changes. Change is our natural state. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I could give them that gift of that understanding, like you're not going to feel like this forever, that that's the one. And lastly, the future of mental health care will be. The future of mental health care, if I have it my way, darn it, um, will be without barriers. Um, bureaucratic barriers to licensing, like we talked about earlier, uh, financial barriers and the managed care system that, you know, y'all makes our work next to impossible, uh, access barriers in terms of telehealth and client access. Um, I think the future of mental health, if the good people win, uh, will be without barriers. It has to be, right? Because the barriers are the reason why the numbers are not moving in the direction that we like. Right. Challenges are going to come and go. COVID did nobody any favors. We understand why a lot of these things are happening, but our ability to respond has been severely hamstrung by those three factors, the bureaucratic you know, barriers to licensure, the financial barriers to just running a practice and operating in this world. Uh, I mean, you know, people hear doctor, I'm sure they think, oh gosh, no problems. Let me let me show you some stuff. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. you know? I mean, um, and then access barriers. There are a lot of people out there right now. I'm absolutely convinced. I know this to be true that want help desperately and have no way of getting it right now. Whether it be that they don't have funding, they don't have a car, they don't have internet, they don't know, they don't have the knowledge to know how to connect. So the future of mental health has to be without stigma and without barriers. Love it. Jason Pratt, I love speaking with you and I really do hope yeah. to speak with you again. I'm sure our listeners really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much for this time. I had a blast. You're doing great work. You asked great questions. It was an honor. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Awesome.